This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good evening. Let's try it again. Good evening. Good evening. Excellent, excellent. It's great to see everyone. I'm Kevin Young, Atticus Hagood Professor of Creative Writing and English and Curator of Literary Collections in the Raymond Donowski Poetry Library here at Emory. And I have the good fortune of working alongside these two fabulous people who are up here tonight. Uh, so I personally know what a treat you all are in for. It's my pleasure to welcome you to another creativity conversation, part of an ongoing series that celebrates innovation by exploring how artists, writers, scientists, and creative thinkers approach risk-taking and the boundaries of knowledge. These conversations with figures ranging from writers Salman Rushdie and Margaret Atwood to composer Philip Glass, jazz musician Gary Motley, and evolutionary biologist E.O. Wilson are conducted, and I mean in the symphonic sense, by Rosemary McGee. She is Vice President and Secretary of Emory University and was recently named Director of the University's Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library. Tonight, she is hosting poet Natasha Trethewey, whose latest book is Thrall, a meditation on history and race and the age of reason, or is it unreason, of enlightenment That's with the good. pun intended. <laughs> Natasha was recently named the Poet Laureate of the United States and is also Poet Laureate of Mississippi because one Poet Laureateship at a time is never enough. <laughs> she is also the newly named Robert W. Woodruff Professor of English and Creative Writing and the Director of the Creative Writing Program. So you see, these are people I admire and can relate to, not least of which because they hold more than one job at a time. <laughs> a few housekeeping things. Please take a moment to not just silence, but perhaps even turn off your cell phones. After tonight's conversation, there will be a book signing and reception. Please join us for that. Note, too, that we have for sale tonight a limited edition broadside printed by hand of the first poem in Natasha's new book. The poem, Elegy, is one of my favorites and has become a signature poem of hers and one that I gathered in the Best American Poetry 2011. And I don't think it's too soon uh, or indiscreet to reveal it'll be in the best of the best American poetry, gathering 25 years of that publication out this spring. The broadsides are a limited edition and they're really unique works of art, printed by hand, letterpress, that she'll be happy to sign. We have a special discount price for you all and even deeper discount for students, so get them while they last. Her first broadside, which we did in the library, is now sold out, so you've been warned. I hope, too, you've been welcomed here tonight to hear this wonderful conversation between Natasha Trethway and Rosemary McGee. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin, for that introduction. And also, in terms of people having more than one job, I think you're another <laughs> exemplar of that as Absolutely. well. And uh, thanks to all of you who are here as part of this creativity conversation series. It's really meant to be a kind of intimate conversation, such as we have tonight, to explore ideas, the creative impulse, and what, what we have in common as human beings in terms of the way that we think about and interpret the world. So it's especially meaningful for those of us who are here, part of the Emory community, Natasha, to be able to have this conversation with you because we think of you first, really, as an Emory professor, as well as an Emory poet. Now, the Robert Woodruff Professor of English and Creative Writing, which is quite a remarkable designation as well, and also the Poet Laureate. And I'm just wondering how it feels when you hear that term, Poet Laureate, and think of yourself. Well, you know, it's going to sound silly to say this, but I, I just gave a, a reading um, in Gwinnett County yesterday uh, for the Gwinnett Reads um, annual reading series. And this has happened a couple of times, walking into a room of people who um, 
applaud what I know to be the office of the poet laureate, um, more than the poet who inhabits it, um, but the office of it. And so it's, it's very humbling um, to, to have that, that title accompany my name. When I first went to the uh, Library of Congress to meet with all the people there, the librarian, uh, the head of, and also the head of the Poetry and Literature Center there. Um, they told me that, um, well, first I said to them that when I went to the Pulitzer celebration, they said to me, now you know the first line of your obituary. And when I went to the Library of Congress, they said to me, well, now you know the line that replaces that line. <laughs> So it's a little, it's daunting, it's humbling, it's, it, it, it's, it's a deep, deep honor. And we, we feel honored by it as well, just to think about your voice being among those voices that people are hearing and listening to and, and thinking about their own sense of meaning. And, you know, I've thought a lot about, we tend to think of our culture as one of kind of mass consumerism or materialistic and media crazed. And yet we can have a poetry reading or um, that, that you've given as you did for the Decatur Book Festival and 700 people come to that. Similarly, other writers um, come to the Emory campus and there's a response to that as well. And so it, it feels to me that there's some kind of quality in our culture mm -hmm. that is seeking the kind of knowledge mm -hmm. that you are are suggesting through your poetry. And, and do you think of poetry as a particular kind of knowledge, a way, way of seeing and being in the world? You know, I, I absolutely think so. Um, one of the things that I've noticed already in this position, it's not, not completely unlike the kinds of things that people would say to me after a reading before I was a poet laureate. Oftentimes, people get dragged to readings um, <laughs> Uh, as a professor, I know we insist that our students go to a number of readings, um, but also this happens at other universities or family members encourage their, their relatives to come. And I've taken note of it even more um, since June, how many people come up to me and say, I'm really not a poetry person. I really didn't think I had any interest in poetry. I came to this because my sister, my cousin, or I saw it in the newspaper, or I come to all the events they have at this place, no matter what they are. Um, and, and they show up and they say to me, but now I think I, I'm kind of interested in poetry. Mm -hmm. I kind of think that I might go to another one of these things. Um, and so I think that people end up there accidentally, but what they realize is that poetry has always been a kind of knowledge that's been there for them all along. Um, something that we may have forgotten we could relate to, something that um, perhaps we've never known, and yet it's hearing a certain poem or reading a certain poem that can bring any of us to poetry, to the kind of knowledge that poetry is. And I think people turn to it in all sorts of situations, um, from the extremes of, of grief, um, like all the people who wrote poems after 9-11, to the extremes of joy, like all the people we know who asked to have a poem read at their weddings mm -hmm. or um, at the christening of a child, uh, a birth. Um, but poetry, of course, speaks to us all the days in between, all the ordinary days of our lives, if we find the right poems for us. Do you remember hearing child, uh, poetry as a child? and thinking and feeling connected to that, the words and the images then as well as now? Well, you know, I think like, like most people, um, I heard verse as mm -hmm. a child, um, everything from the rhymes of Dr. Seuss to the things that my mother would make up, the little rhymes she made up. Um, then there was, of course, in high school, the, the Ruyard Kipling poems um, that so many of us loved. My father, of course, is also a poet, mm -hmm. and so I heard his poems from an early age as well. And yet, there was a moment um, after all of that, after the joys of, of rhyme and meter, the cadences of song that we often love as children, that I, I somehow got turned away from poetry, thinking that um, 
once the, the playfulness of it is gone, what else does it do for us? And so I listened to my father's poems. I liked a lot of them, but then I, I didn't understand a lot of them either. And it wasn't until finding, quite by accident, uh, in a class, the right poem at the right moment that spoke to me about something that was going on in my life that helped bring me back to remembering that poetry speaks to us all the time. Yeah, I was thinking about that when you were talking about people coming to events and saying, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe I do so like bad. poetry. Yeah, yeah, it's not so bad. <laughs> and, and in a way, I think that um, it's possible to be a bit afraid of poetry, to right. think it's something that's outside of your reach right. or something that you can't really understand mm -hmm. until perhaps when they hear you or another poet read um, or read a poem oneself, mm -hmm. and, and it, there's that connection. Right. Well, you know, um, I certainly felt that way. Um, I think the last time as a high school student that I really remembered liking poetry was um, the poems of Robert Frost, mm -hmm. uh, Stopping by the Woods on a Snowy Evening, The Road Not Taken, but also that poem whose author I can't recall right now um, about Richard Corey, Maybe some of you guys remember that poem, but I remember thinking, I like what this poem says. It's also saying it with rhyme. But then that was kind of it for a while, which seems odd to me because, as I said before, I, I'm the daughter of a poet. But when the moment that I came back to poetry or, or understood that it could grieve with me as well as celebrate with me, was um, sometime after my mother died. Um, and I had tried writing poems right after that myself, and they were very bad poems. But something in me knew that in order to try to make sense of that loss, I had to write a poem. And I don't know why, but I knew that that was the only language that could help me make sense of, of that loss. Well, I, it must have been in, a, in an English class uh, when I was an undergraduate that I read um, uh, Auden's Musée de Beaux-Arts, mm -hmm. about suffering they were never wrong, the old masters. And of course, this is a poem that goes on to, you know, it's talking about the, the landscape with the fall of Icarus and seeing that tiny little Icarus falling into the sea over in the corner while the rest of the world goes on about its business, not even knowing about this tiny little tragedy. And that's what it felt like when I lost my mother, that I was completely alone. And then I read that poem and I thought, well, I'm not alone, mm -hmm. not at all. Um, you mentioned something there that I wanted to talk to you about, and that is that um, your use of other types of images, mm -hmm. um, beyond the images of words, even on the covers of some of your volumes, their photographs, right. um, you frequently refer to paintings. And I'm wondering if there's something about the artistic rendering that you see in the, in the world, perhaps in a museum or mm -hmm. in an archive, maybe even more frequently in an archive or mm -hmm. perhaps somebody's house. So you see an image and is that, a, is that an inspirational moment for you? Do, you? do you feel a poem coming from that kind of external image that maybe matches some internal Right, state? poems, yes, you know, poems always come for me from an external image mm -hmm. like that. I mean, I think I grew up, um, you know, as a child in Mississippi and then in Georgia, certainly being attuned to all the kind of sensory uh, stimulation that we get. But the image, the visual image, always seemed to be the most powerful to me. Um, I can remember needing so much to record images of my grandmother's house. I only spent the summers in Mississippi with my grandmother, and I missed her terribly, and so Part of what I did to keep that with me was to memorize her entire house. Wow. I could see every single room, and I used to regale, or I thought I did, um, my fellow classmates on the school bus in the morning by describing where every object was in my grandmother's house. But they did listen to me, and I don't know if it was that my grandmother's house was so interesting or that I could recall it in such great detail. Um, but that was a thing I started doing early on, making a picture of everything in my head so that I could keep it. So naturally, when I started writing, I had to start there. If I couldn't see it, 
then I couldn't write about it. Um, and so I turned to photographs to have a kind of given image from which to depart in my thinking about what had happened, for example, just before or after a photograph, what were the conditions of its creation, what's being cropped out that I can't see. I look at paintings in the same way, thinking about the decisions that another artist has made in terms of what to show us mm -hmm. and what not to show us. And there's a kind of frizzen there that's very interesting to me, both in the ability to describe what I do see and then to imagine what I don't see. So the erasures become a place mm -hmm. to investigate. And so do you have an example of a poem or from one of your volumes um, that really kind of captures that um, instinct in, in you, where, the, where that has taken you? Well, you know, I, I started off a lot um, writing about a lot of photographs like that in, um, in my book, Domestic Work. But I do, I do have a poem here in Native Guard that's about a photograph. Those of you who've been in Atlanta uh, for a long time might remember um, the, the ice storm of, of the, the early 70s. I feel nervous now that I'm saying this because in my mind it was in 1971, but it actually might be 1972. Those of you who remember can probably tell me about that. But um, this is a poem that is about the memory of that storm, but it's also about a photograph. The only thing that we have to to sort of remember something about that. And in the poem, there is a real contradiction between what is in the photograph and, of course, what can't be there. So much of the story surrounding the making of the photograph, both before and after. So I'll, I'll just read that. Photograph, Ice Storm, 1971. Why the rough edge of beauty? Why the tired face of a woman suffering made luminous by the camera's eye? Or the storm that drives us inside for days, power lines down, food rotting in the refrigerator, while outside the landscape glistens beneath a glaze of ice? Why remember anything but the wonder of those few days the iced trees, each leaf in its glassy case. The picture we took that first morning, the front yard, a beautiful, strange place. Why on the back has someone made a list of our names, the date, the event, nothing of what's inside, mother, stepfather's fist? So much cropped out of the photograph. Right. And yet, when I started working on that one, the first stanza really refers to, um, I guess it's a, a, the, a Dorothea Lang photograph mm -hmm. of the woman, I think a woman um, who's very gaunt and it's clear that she's starving um, in the 30s, either Dust Bowl or South. Um, and yet, there's something so strangely beautiful about her suffering face. So I began meditating on why that is. Why is there so much beauty in the, in the images of people we see suffering? I, I remember seeing Sharon Olds do some work like that in, um, in The Dead and the Living. But from there, of course, the poem moves on to contemplate the photograph that my family took mm -hmm. um, outside because it was a winter wonderland. It was gorgeous. And yet that beauty said nothing about what was going on inside the house with the power out, the food that's in the refrigerator, and the violence going on in the house. And the poem also points to that um, kind of shared state, I guess, we all live in, and being both the, ex the external environment that you've just described and the internal, the right. interiority, not just of the house, but also of right. the poet experiencing that. So, yes, yeah, so there is a lot that ends up being excluded, mm -hmm. but perhaps by shining a focus, it becomes more, in a way, more inclusive, or at least deeper. I think a photograph becomes a window uh, to look at not only what's there, but what's not there as well. I, 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 when I think of you and your poetry, and actually this goes back to a conversation you and I had many years ago, um, 
I, I think of you as much, in a way, as a historian, as a poet. And, I, and my, my thoughts about that are around both the recording of events mm -hmm. that have happened in the world, um, such as Native Guard, mm -hmm. um, as well as personal events, mm -hmm. events that have happened to you and that, in a way, other people can connect to. So I see that historical part of your work as, um, as essential to the poetry that you write. And do you see yourself as well as a kind of historian, if you will? Well, I'm glad that you said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, I have to say that, that what happens a lot in descriptions of me as a poet is that it becomes um, easy, and perhaps maybe this is what's actually more interesting to, to audiences, to focus on what is deeply personal mm -hmm. about my poem, so that the personal history becomes the thing that people focus on. And I always get a little annoyed that um, people aren't necessarily setting um, my personal experience within a larger historical context, because that's, to me, the only way it makes sense. It isn't as if I'm writing poems about my little memories. Mm -hmm because my little memories are actually memories of a culture. Um, they're, they're part of the larger narrative of collective memory, which is, of course, historical memory. My experience of race, for example, or even domestic violence has everything to do with the laws at the time, which are, of course, you know, a kind of legal history of the nation. When you when you look at the individual story, you can also look at the larger his history, which is written into our legal history, uh, our social history. Um, and so I see my investigation of the self as always a deeply historical thing. I see myself doing the larger social or public history first and allowing that to be the way into an investigation and a meditation upon the self. So I would rather see it the way that you described it, um, as opposed to, I mean, you know, for example, this was a very lovely um, article that came out in the New York Times right after mm -hmm. I was appointed. But the headline was, Poet Digs Deep Into Memory. Mm -hmm. Now, unless you say I dig deep into cultural memory, which is all of ours, or historical memory, um, all you're saying is I dig deep into my personal memory. And I'm actually digging deep into historical memory of a nation. And I think that that, um, that work requires actual, as I understand it from you, and also just observing and thinking about it, research. Mm -hmm. That you are somebody who sees herself as a researcher, and so when you go into um, a place mm -hmm. or an archive or historical moment, it's not in largely or entirely thinking about, well, how does this feel to me, right. but what, what actually happened. Right. I'm way more interested in research and what I can learn that I don't already know than myself. <laughs> you know, I'd like to think I'm an interesting person, but I really, <laughs> I get excited about um, going into those places, doing the research, going into an archive, and finding something that I didn't know before, and then figuring out how it has an impact on my life, you know, what it says about my position in the world, my place along the continuum of history. Mm -hmm. But history is what it interests me first, and then I find out how it has an impact on my life, and actually how my life then speaks back mm -hmm. to history to illuminate it in a contemporary moment. And it also seems that the history that you speak to is a history that has not always been inclusive of some of those other voices that are out there and other experiences. So those are perhaps the experiences that are cropped out, right? Right, well, when you think about that cropping, um, you know, it's, it's, it's still, interesting to me, um, and this happens both here in the United States and in other places that I've, other countries that I've gone, for example, to talk about Native Guard and the African-American presence in the Civil War, uh, military presence in the Civil War. 
I am constantly met with people who have no idea that nearly 200,000 African Americans fought in the Civil War um, on the side of the Union. Often people think that um, African Americans were uh, sim simply passive recipients of benevolence on the part of the Union, um, who, f you know, and the President to free them, and not that there was actually a battle, that they had to take up arms to help with that and to help push the country closer to realizing its ideals uh, in the Constitution. Um, so it is, in some ways, even as historians um, know about this and write about this and give lectures about this, that there are some lay people who have no idea. Um, and so uh, for me, it, that does become a kind of erasure that, you know, can a poem help fill in some of the gaps in that kind of erasure? Uh, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe I might reach people who aren't picking up David Blight's most recent book about uh, African Americans in the Civil War or, con you know, uh, many other historians. So maybe it might come because they picked up Native Guard or because they've heard me give a reading. Um, but I very much feel uh, compelled to try to fill in the gaps in some of our cultural memory. Uh, Robert Hayden once said that uh, he writes in order to um, correct a lot of the misapprehensions of African American history. I, I feel compelled to do the same thing. So how did you actually conduct the research that you did for Native Guard? Where did you find those materials? Where did you find those experiences? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the first place that I, that, I, that I looked, actually, you know, I'd been going out to Ship Island, which is where the Louisiana Native Guards were stationed um, off the coast of my hometown for years with my grandmother. And it wasn't exactly mentioned in the park rangers tour that these black soldiers had been stationed there, that they were Union soldiers, that they were guarding Confederate prisoners. And I found out about it quite accidentally, um, talking to my grandmother in a restaurant, and a woman overheard our conversation. I was talking about Ship Island, and she said, I think there's something else you need to know about Ship Island. And she told me, and I assumed she was a school teacher or a librarian or something, more like a guardian angel, because she, she told me this thing that then sent me to the Gulfport Public Library. So that's where I started. Okay. I started... Let's hear for libraries. Yes, <laughs> let's hear for libraries. <laughs> so uh, I went straight to the Gulfport Public Library to try to find anything that I could about... Um, these black soldiers. And there was, uh, I found someone's MA thesis uh, in the library who mentioned um, the Native Guards in, in a paragraph. And so from then on, I started looking. And I uh, wound up spending a summer in Washington um, at the Library of Congress. Um, so in there, yeah. So it's, it's nice to get to go back there. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I spent um, most of the summer going over to the Madison Building, which houses all the archives, the documents, uh, and requesting you know, everything from Civil War letters, uh, things like that. And then I would go over to the Jefferson Building and then write in the afternoons. I also went to Marble um, and, and asked to see some of our papers and collections that we had about the Civil War. So it was all, you know, there were, of course, uh, plenty of books that I read that, you know, my secondary sources, uh, reading the historians, um, but the primary documents I found in the Library of Congress and in Marble. And did you have a concept for the, the collection at that point, or was it something that, that developed over time? That as you worked on it, you began to see how these, these poems would come together in a particular way? All I knew at the beginning was that I was stunned that I'd been going to that place my whole life and knew nothing of that history, that there were no monuments or markers that told a fuller version of the history of Ship Island. And so it just began with me wanting to find out more about it and to tell that story. I never realized at the beginning that that had anything to do with also um, 
remembering and memorializing my mother's life. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, what I, what I came to understand, uh, that it happened in the writing of the poem, the way poems, of course, mm-hmm. always reveal to us things we, we haven't known. Um, I was writing elegies about my mother, uh, but I didn't see them as connected to the poems that were about the Civil War soldiers. Um, until one day, um, I'd been jogging through the graveyard in Decatur mm-hmm. near my home, and um, I was just compelled to read all the tombstones. It was sort of a day that made me feel like all the dead needed to be remembered. I was in that Confederate section, and so I just kept, I kept stopping to read all the stones. And then I went home, and I thought, well, I'm going to write a poem about the Confederate dead in this cemetery because I was working on Civil War poems. But what came out was a poem about the day that we, we buried my mother. And the poem uh, is a blue sonnet, and it ends in a rhyming couplet that reads, I wander now among names of the dead, my mother's name, stone pillow for my head. And of course, the image of that is supposed to suggest the idea of a kind of cold comfort that if you had lost someone, it might be nice in some ways to to be able to go to the graveyard and and maybe even to lay your head down on the stone with her name on it. Um, And I knew it was the right image for the emotion that the poem was trying to get at. And yet, I had never in all those years that my mother had been dead put a stone on her grave. So she was buried in an unmarked grave. Um, So in many ways, my mother was not unlike those Civil War soldiers to whom no monuments had been erected. But it was not until I wrote that poem that I remembered it um, and realized that I was telling a lie for the sake of, a factual lie for the sake of an emotional truth, a larger truth in the poem. But it was at that moment that I knew that these poems belonged together Mm -hmm. because they had been sort of forgotten our national duty to remember them had not been taken care of. Mm -hmm. My native duty to my mother had not been taken care of in terms of remembrance. In terms of your own role, in a way, as a native guard. Exactly. Um, So that term, native guard, I I want to talk about also your relationship to the Oxford English Dictionary, um, which I've heard you speak about before. And that... um, as, as I understand it, that's a source of a lot of, um, again, like, like a photograph or mm-hmm. like a painting, the, the word, the meaning of the word itself. Mm-hmm. And I think that came into play with both Native Guard and also with your most recent poetry right. collection, Thrall. So yeah, tell us that story, how those, that well, connects. Well, yeah, I mean, we know that every word is a poem in itself, you know, because there's, you know, there's the history of the word, um, all its uses uh, through, across time, um, all the, the secondary and tertiary definitions that can help deepen the figurative level of a poem. And so for that reason, I always look up and encourage my students to do the same. Um, when I'm reading their poems, I look up the words, simple words, that I think I should know in case there are deeper levels of meaning that are being employed by the choice of that diction. So when I was um, working on Native Guard, for example, I was trying to think of the word native in so many different ways. You can't title a book Native Guard and not think about Native Son. Um, You can't title a book Native Guard and not think of Native Americans. So one of the things that happened in Native Guard is that um, I I wrote a poem called Elegy for the People. Mm -hmm. And because I I did that because so many, especially, you know, what what I know to be true in Mississippi, but I guess this is the case everywhere, that um, many Native American uh, names mean the people. Um, So I'd been thinking about those names in Mississippi that mean the people, and so I wanted to, in the book, suggest that I've thought about the word native in that way, too, in terms of the first Americans. So uh, I wrote this poem, Elegy for the People, and I don't think that it ever came together in a way that um, 
I thought, made it a good poem. So it got edited out of the manuscript. I mean, I took it out, not my editor, I did. Um, and I've always regretted that in some ways because I wanted to suggest I'm thinking about language on that level, on so many levels. I mean, in, in Beyond Katrina, you know, I kind of, you know, sort of riff on the idea of the prefix, uh, native, national, Natasha, nativity, okay. all these words that share, nativity as they well. share that prefix. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my name has the same prefix as native and national. And um, so to jump ahead, when I was working on, uh, when I first started thinking about the book Thrall, the first thing that came to me was its title because I was finishing Native Guard and looking in the OED at the word native. And I was surprised to see that the definition that came up first was not what I expected, not someone who's a native of Mississippi or a native plant. What came first was someone born into the condition of servitude, a thrall. So the word native in my title, Native Guard, gave me the word thrall in my next book. And had you ever heard the word thrall used in that way? You know, I don't think I'd ever heard thrall used to say a, a slave or something in that way. I always heard thrall as part of the word enthrall. Um, I think I'd also heard it as part of the phrase I-N space T. H-R-A-L-L, -L. Mm -hmm. so not just the word enthrall, but the, the phrase enthrall too. Right. Okay. Um, and, and so it, it really opened up possibilities for exploration in this new book in terms of what we're enthralled by, mm -hmm. beauty, the beloved, whatever, and what we're enthralled to, language, knowledge, ideas, power. So maybe in a way, sort of like captive and captivated. Right. We're held captive to something, right. but if we're... Mm -hmm. Captivated has a completely different nuance. Well, we're ca captivated has great uh, yes. connotations. I'm, that painting is captivating. <laughs> Rosemary, you are enthralling as an interviewer. You oh, know, thank you. <laughs> Those kinds yeah. of things. But, but then enthrall the does not have a good meaning. It, it means that we are in servitude to, and I think we are enthralled to language and to ideology. Um, having grown up, you know, black and biracial, born in the Deep South in, in Mississippi in 1966 when my parents' marriage uh, was still illegal because of anti-miscegenation laws, because there were names in legal documents to, to call biracial people, because I was sort of rendered uh, illegal in the eyes of the state as well as the nation. This is before 1967 in Loving versus the State of Virginia. I felt very enthralled mm -hmm. to language, the language of law as well as the language of custom to name me. And yet you didn't have really that language to speak of that experience until you began your kind of poet, your poetic explorations. I think that's true. I think, I think, you know, you feel what it is to, they're, they're, they're names you hear, there are terms that you hear, so language is what comes first in some ways. Before you even begin to think about, am I a divided self? What does it mean to be mixed blood? There's language that's been applied to you first. So it becomes the way in to think about that. So it makes sense that that's the way in to think about it in terms of poetry as well to begin not only with that language, but to go back to something else you said earlier, the imagery that accompanies that language. So the Mexican Costa paintings that I write about in Thrall have both. They have both um, the imagery, the painting of the, the, the parents, uh, the mixed race union, and then the offspring they would have produced, as well as the names, the taxonomies named made to name those mixed blood people. Mm -hmm. And when you hear those terms applied to you or other people, they, they have a, um, they, a kind of an otherness to them, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't, doesn't necessarily match your own self-concept or your own experience, but you hear that and in a way adopt it. You become, um, have to, I don't know if I'm expressing this well, but you see, you have to see that point of view. That point of view is kind of has a kind of power. Oh, I think it does. You know, one of the first poems, I suppose it was probably the second poem I ever wrote, 
um, once I went to graduate school and, and started writing poems rather than fiction, seriously, um, was a poem called Zebra. And I had the experience of being called a zebra back in New Orleans um, uh, in the early 1970s. So, you know, I, again, this, this goes back to your question about um, writing about history or writing about memory. Someone might look at that poem and think, oh, she's, she's writing about this experience, it, her memory of being called a zebra, where I see myself as writing about language mm -hmm. because it was language that made the poem happen, that someone had a word for what they thought they saw in me. Um, it's, that, that's a memory that doesn't just belong to me. Mm -hmm. it, it belongs to our national memory right. in terms of how we've divided and parsed human beings. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about, in, in the collection Thrall, that you ha at the start you have epigraphs by two poets, mm -hmm. Robert Penn Warren and T.S. Eliot. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you were named Poet Laureate, um, there was a, f a frequent mention, actually, of Robert Penn Warren mm -hmm. as the former uh, U.S. Poet Laureate who was also from the South. And, um, but you chose these two poets, mm -hmm. which is a pretty... Um, substantial decision to make, mm -hmm. to have at the beginning of your volume. And both of them, and we've already talked about this a little bit, but I think there's another avenue to it. Both of them write about, think about knowledge mm -hmm. in relationship to both love and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about your, your selection of Warren and Eliot as mm -hmm. kind of poetic influences and um, what, what you learned from them as a poet. Well, in terms of influences, um, Robert Penn Warren, for me, is the, is the greater influence. Um, uh, he's a poet who's um, a person, a writer, whose career, um, whose trajectory as a thinker um, has meant a lot to me. So everything from you know, looking at his poems, his, his Audubon poem is, is one of my favorite poems, you know, Tell Me a Story of Deep Delight. Um, but also in, in writing Beyond Katrina, for example, the model of his uh, 1956 um, serialized uh, meditation segregation, mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it meant a lot to me. It was, a, it was a great sort of model for me to look at, to think about someone writing what is part travel narrative, part journalistic kind of interview, part meditation and deep investigation of the self and previously held positions. Um, that gave me a way to think about returning to my South after Katrina, uh, to, to look at things and to think about nostalgia, mm -hmm. and to think about my place. So, uh, and to see him be a man in the midst of change, you know, someone who, whose position in, the, in segregation was dare, very different from his position in the 30s and I'll take my stand. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, I, I really admire that about his work. I should also say, in case people don't know, you know, Robert Penn Warren was uh, not only a consultant uh, in poetry, which is the original name of the, the Poet Laureate before it got changed in 1986, okay. but then he was the first Poet Laureate. So he'd been a consultant and then the first Poet Laureate in 1986. Uh, something else um, unknown, because you know, sometimes people just people can look at him and only think about his, uh, his I'll take my stand uh, self and not sort of the, the more evolving self. But it should be noted, and I'd like to know how many times this has happened. It may be the only time. Uh, one of the duties of the Poet Laureate is to choose the, the young poets for the Witter Binner uh, Prize uh -huh. and introduce those poets at the Library of Congress for their reading. Robert Penn Warren chose Rita Dove as a Witter Binner, who of course later became a Poet Laureate Lord. herself. Right. Yeah. But I thought that was significant about him. But <laughs> to get back to your question about those epigraphs, I should also say that, you know, I feel like not long after I figured out that Thrall was going to be the title of this book, one of the next things I figured out before the book was really written um, was that those two epigraphs were going to be in place there. And, you know, unlike in Native Guard, where I use epigraphs throughout at the beginning of sections, I only wanted those two really to stand as... 
a, a kind of way for a reader to understand how to read everything that comes afterwards. And so the, the, the two epigraphs, um, so the, the one from Robert Penn Warren is from the Audubon poem. Um, it, is, it is from a section in that poem in which he's sort of talking about um, Audubon as, um, well, being someone who, who had to kill the, the, the birds in order to reanimate them in a way that made them look even more alive. Um, and, you know, he would also dissect them. He would cook them and eat them. Um, and so the idea that, that Robert Penn Warren um, proposes in, this, in, the, in, the, in the lines that I choose is something about the idea of how that deep connection uh, which brings about more knowledge is in some ways about love. And so the epigraph reads, what is love? One name for it is knowledge. Um, so I was thinking, okay, that may be true. I love my father, he loves me, but there's been a difficult knowledge between us and an evolving knowledge. And so the T.S. Eliot quote that follows reads, after such knowledge, what forgiveness. I think that, um, you know, the revelations of knowledge, particularly in this country, are difficult ones. They're ones that people often would rather find it more comfortable to ignore. But if we actually acknowledge knowledge, if we actually reckon with history, it is a very troubling and difficult thing, but it is the only thing that can perhaps lead to any kind of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the absence of reckoning only uh, will encourage the festering of wounds that have not healed. And I think those of us from Mississippi, for example, know that mm -hmm. very deeply. So when you talk about that, I was also thinking about the, um, the, your poem, The Miracle of the Black Leg, mm -hmm. um, and in a way how our, our bodies um, become our sense of identity, mm -hmm. you know, and, that, and that's true for us as individuals, but in this case, this is a story, The Miracle of the Black Leg, this is a story that's told over and mm -hmm. over and over again, different, mm -hmm. different places, different meanings, mm -hmm. but always has the same sort of context for it or intentionality about it, mm -hmm. which is, you know, is, is this black leg, you know, appropriate for this body or can it save this mm -hmm. person's life? But what about the life mm -hmm. that was lost or deteriorated? Mm -hmm. Yeah, who was it taken <laughs> away from? Um, yeah, it's, you know, I have lines in that poem um, about, about knowledge and about history. Um, you know, I ask in the poem, um, what knowledge haunts each body? What history? What phantom ache? And you know, when we think about sort of the phantom ache of, of lost limbs, mm -hmm. um, you know, we know that people talk about how uh, uh, amputees still feel pain or itch in the place that's lost. And so there's a way that even the absence speaks to some kind of physical body memory of the past or of some trauma. Um, I think that, you know, what I'm trying to suggest in looking at that imagery uh, is a figurative notion of uh, what history haunts us as uh, 21st century Americans, uh, 21st century, you know, people worldwide. What, what knowledge of the past still haunts our everyday interactions? What knowledge of history and phantom aches do we carry in our bodies? But we also carry in our minds because we know the past, and the past isn't dead. So we are, in a way, living that past. Mm -hmm. Still. Um, also in that volume, there, I, th I think it's in the poem Elegy, dedicated to your father. Um, early in that poem, we see the drizzle that's needling the surface. This is on a fishing mm -hmm. trip. Is that right? And, um, and I've thought a lot about that image, actually. Um, it seems to me that that's what poetry does, mm -hmm. in a way. That it um, causes us to needle the surface mm -hmm. of our experience. And mm -hmm. again, that's one of those words. You think about needle, we... we right. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> yeah it, sti it sticks, it hurts. It can be very painful. 
but also in the case of acupuncture, it can be very healing. Mm -hmm. So it has, like, as you pointed out, in so many different words. So uh, do you see that connection between both the pain mm -hmm. um, that we're just talking about, really, and also the possibilities that, that exist once we come, come to terms with that pain? Rosemary, that was such a great metaphor that I, it, I find it difficult to build upon it except mm -hmm. to just draw it out a little bit because it's wonderful. I mean, I was thinking when you first said that, that, you know, I don't want to be a drag um, <laughs> because poems are happy too and, sure. and we like them at weddings and they celebrate with us and everything. But I think my students sometimes think I'm a drag because, you know, I'm also looking at the ways that poems aren't necessarily there even though I was comforted, let me say this, this is what it is. Even as I was comforted by Auden's poem about how the world isn't seeing the death of Icarus, that's a horrible thought, that we die or someone, we lose someone, and no one cares, nothing stops, no one sees it, and yet the poem still comforted me. So I'm of the mind that, you know, poems shouldn't, be greeting cards to make us feel better. That what's comforting about them is being reminded that we're not alone in our thoughts, in our experiences. So, you know, a poem that's going to challenge you, that's going to make you have to confront difficult things about yourself or the world, that's what I want from a poem. And I find that that's comforting, actually. So, yes, I think you're absolutely right. It does both things. It needles us to think deeply about something and perhaps have to rethink ourselves and our position in the world and everything we've thought up into that moment. Mm -hmm. But if we do that, I guess it is like acupun acupuncture. So isn't that wonderful that she said that? I mean, <laughs> I'm gonna use that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was just to prolong the, uh, the meditation <laughs> on the word needle, I was also thinking of needle as a tool All right. that we use and that when you use that with a thread in it, that it's mm -hmm. often something that, that... It can release pain and, yes. and but also, yeah. It can, and, it can, and it can correct things, it mm -hmm. can fix things, it can make things, mm -hmm. so that things can be made with a needle. So. Um, I, I guess that's what I like about learning about poetry by hearing you talk about it and reading your poetry because I, I think it causes all of us, I hope it causes all of us to reflect more deeply on, on the words and that idea mm -hmm. that actually in every word there is a poem. That's what you hope for. So it's great <laughs> when someone does it, you know. Yeah. And uh, also related to the Audubon poem by Warren, I was thinking about that as well in the poem Knowledge in mm -hmm. your volume Thrall about the men staring at the corpse mm -hmm. there. And there is that kind of, as Audubon did, there is, you know, there is that kind of knowledge that we learn as our students in our medical school learn, right? right by right. actually looking at and dealing with the corpse in order to be, to heal. Right, right. Um, even when you said that, I thought, wow, I really am a drag. You know, the next thing Rosemary has to say is, so that poem of yours about looking at a corpse. <laughs> um, but, but yes, I mean, uh, there's a lot of dissections in this book, actually. Uh, I realize it's a little macabre. There's a lot of parsings uh, in terms of language, but parsings in terms of literal dissections and, and opening up to, to find uh, what's inside. I guess a kind of love, a kind of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, I like that opening up to see what's inside. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's sort of what it requires, even if it's if it's housed in what seems like difficult subject matter. Uh, you know, I'm not simply trying to be macabre. I am trying to 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 get closer to figuring out how we make sense of, uh, of these various things. And so, you know, that image in that poem that you're describing was just another thing that when I saw it accidentally, I knew I had to write about it and I didn't know why. So I just began by describing the dissection itself, uh, what I could see, the, the, uh, the drawing of the dissection. And it's a very strange drawing, it's kind of jaunty, you know, the, the uh, anatomist who's doing the work, you know, has, has just made this incision um, and he's still got the blade in one hand, but he's taken, 
the, the flap of skin where he's made the incision and he's opening it like this, very sort of dainty and looking as if he's peering inside like what rabbit will jump out of her chest, you know, now that we've done this. So it's a very strange image in that way, but everyone is sort of standing there looking around waiting for what's about to be revealed. Um, and, I, and I just began describing that and it wasn't until later um, that the poem takes a more personal turn. And it really becomes about the ways that I felt um, examined, mm -hmm. studied, dissected, and parsed by my own father, you know, who is like those learned men in that room, trying to make sense of this uh, creature, this, mm -hmm. this corpse they have before them. I felt examined in that way by my father, um, which is the kind of examination that we begin to think about in, in the enlightenment, you know, study and classification. That's what I felt like. And speaking of the enlightenment and also carrying on that theme um, with your father is the figure of Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm. that we all admire in mm -hmm. many ways mm -hmm. for what he, the ways in which the enlightenment um, and those ideas and ideals have mm -hmm. influenced us. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a, there's a whole other story there. Right. There's a whole no, another side to it. And that you, you also have gone through that kind of process of mm -hmm. thinking about Thomas Jefferson and in, in continuing that dialogue with your father in that regard as well. You know, um, Karen Stolle in uh, Spanish and Portuguese uh, earlier this afternoon called it sort of the Janus head of um, the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Because of course we have all the things about the Enlightenment ideals that we've been given that are wonderful, and yet we also have uh, in the Enlightenment the, um, the codification of ideas of racial difference, things that we still hold on to today in many ways. So that you could have both of these things occurring at once. Um, you can have both of these things occurring in writers like Kant, or Jefferson, you know, people that, you know, my father was always quoting. And you could have the contradictions and complexities in human beings that are made painfully clear to us about Thomas Jefferson uh, in, in your own father. Um, and so, um, you know, to, to, to be able to look at that, um, and I wish I could quote this, because I know there's a scholar now who um, I should be able to tell you his name. I just read the article. Um, a scholar who's working on a, a, a sentence that has been left out, uh, a sentence in a letter by Thomas Jefferson that scholars in many ways have intentionally left out that suggests something slightly different about Jefferson and his decision to continue to keep slaves. Um, that actually it became quite mon a money-making venture that made him think, hmm, well, maybe I should keep them instead. Mm -hmm. So that sort of changes how the narrative of how we've thought about his decisions and, and his being troubled about um, slavery. Um, my father and I had debates about Jefferson for years. Um, my father, because he, like many of us, sort of sees Jefferson as such a hero, it was really hard to also see his shortcomings, to also sort of integrate into who he was these things that are less attractive, um, things that, you know, from notes of the state of, on the state of Virginia and ongoing. Um, but of course, you know, once Annette Gordon-Reed started publishing and winning, um, mm -hmm. you know, Pulitzer Prizes and National Book Awards for her books, I started sending them to my father every Christmas um, so that uh, I could actually prove to him that I had won this argument mm -hmm. about um, Jefferson. Um, and now he wants to act as if he never was, conf you know, he never said those things. Um, and yet he did. Um, but it's all, it's all about ideology in a lot of ways. Um, and again, I, I say this, you know, my father, uh, I, I love deeply, my father loves me, and yet the need to write this book and to, uh, in the dedication, write it to him, unlike the dedication in domestic work, which is for my father. This is to my father, um, to another poet, in the language of poetry, a conversation that is deeply personal, but also very public. 
and is not just a conversation for father and daughter, but a conversation for Americans about And not just race, about the two of you. And not just about the two of us. Um, that becomes a way to look at these things. Perhaps it becomes easier for people to confront their own uh, deeply ingrained or unexamined notions of, of racial difference or white supremacy if you can just look at that one guy. But these are things that sort of exist in very subtle ways in the culture. And so, and, 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 and most of us. And most, most of, of us. Right. That's, a, that's a hard thing to have to say. But that's what I'm, I'm saying it to my father and I'm saying it to the nation at the same time. Um, yes, I, I think we hear you saying that. Um, and I, I want to kind of close with a question and then ask you to read another poem for us. But um, I see you, I, I guess we tend to think of poets, it's a lot of solitude or in a house in the woods. And yet when I read your poetry and I hear you talk and I know something about you, I, I, I see you as a poet that reads and talks about community. And that community might be the community where your grandmother lived in Gulfport, mm -hmm. right? Or that community might be the community of Decatur, Georgia, where mm -hmm. I know you're an active participant. Or that community might be the larger stage of these United States. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 I see the import, I, I increasingly see the important value and experience of community, and I wonder if you see that about yourself, that you're a poet who lives in, in community rather than in kind of se separation from the community. Well, I, you know, I certainly try to create my house in the woods in my head, mm -hmm. you know, so that I can at least go to a place that allows poems to get written. But I do find that um, if there is a public persona that I have, uh, at a conversation like this, at a reading I give. Because my poems touch on some all the things we've been talking about today, I think they often um, create an open space for, in a Q&A, for example, to have conversations about race and about history. And in that way, I've, I've become public um, beyond what I wrote in my poems because my poems open that door, and I'm not going to shut it in a reader's face when they ask me a question about it. So I do find myself having to talk about certain things. I mean, it's a little difficult right now. I mean, sometimes I think, how much should I um, censor myself in, in what I'm talking about? I think that one of my handlers at the library would probably like most for me to remind the public all the time uh, that, um, Poetry is, is, is bipartisan, that it, and it is, um, or, you know, and that it, it's open to all of us, um, and yet it's hard to not, it's hard to listen to me without thinking about things that have been difficult political things throughout our nation's history. Um, and so I know that I'm a poet that makes us think about those things as well. I'd like to think that some of the people who are happy that I'm in this role are happy because of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I want to make sure that anyone who knows that I'm in this role knows that I can both, you know, hope in an Orwellian sense to push us toward a better nation mm -hmm. than we built thus far. And it can be better. Mm -hmm. But also to remind you that the way that poetry does that for us is to remind us that across time and space how we are alike, not that we are different. I, there's nothing I can say that would. Uh, that's I, I. I feel that that's what we're we're again what we're hearing from your voice mm -hmm. and from your presence and from your poetry. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share one additional poem with us this evening. Sure, uh, I, I will read that poem that Kevin mentioned earlier, uh, "Elegy," which is the first poem in Thrall. Elegy for my father. I think by now the river must be thick with salmon. Late August, I imagine it as it was that morning. Drizzle needling the surface, mist at the banks like a net settling around us. Everything damp and shining. 
That morning, awkward and heavy in our hip waders, we stalked into the current and found our places, you upstream a few yards and out far deeper. You must remember how the river seeped in over your boots and you grew heavier with that defeat. All day I kept turning to watch you, how first you mimed our guide's casting, then cast your invisible line, slicing the sky between us. And later, rod in hand, how you tried again and again to find that perfect arc, flight of an insect skimming the river's surface. Perhaps you recall I cast my line and reeled in two small trout we could not keep. Because I had to release them, I confess, I thought about the past, working the hooks loose, the fish writhing in my hands, each one slipping away before I could let go. I can tell you now that I tried to take it all in, record it for an elegy I'd write one day when the time came. Your daughter, I was that ruthless. What does it matter if I tell you I learned to be? You kept casting your line, and when it did not come back empty, it was tangled with mine. Some nights, dreaming, I step again into the small boat that carried us out and watch the bank receding, my back to where I know we are headed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you for all of you who are part of this ongoing Creativity Conversation series on campus and your daily discussions and at events such as these. And we look forward to seeing you at the reception and book signing downstairs. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.